Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Before we dive into today's video, I want to remind everybody that we do have a Patreon now at patreon.com slash cartoonist kayfabe, where there are three tiers. You can choose which one fits you best. It'll give you access to our videos earlier than everybody else. It'll also give you access at the highest level to a live streaming video of us recording, which will give you a leg up on the kayfabe effect. Uh, you'll know what books to try to track down before the uh, general pop goes after them. So we've heard from a lot of you that you want to support us that way. Go for it. And uh, the other way to support us, buy our books. We are working cartoonists. You can see our bibliography here on the screen right now. I have Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Alive, Plain Janes, Hulk Grand Design, Octobriana. Ed has Red Room, Hip Hop Family Tree, X-Men Grand Design, and WYSIWYG. Pick those up at your local comic shop or wherever you buy comics, and we will appreciate it. So today, Ed, we're going to look at an artist that I really like, Mike Allred. I feel like he's been around uh, comics pretty much... As long as I've been reading comics, you know, sure. he shows up in the, uh, I don't know, mid 80s, late, late to mid 80s, uh, starts out very indie. And uh, at this point, I think probably everybody watching our channel is familiar with Mike Allred because he's done work for everybody all over the place. Some of the biggest characters on Earth. And um, one of the more interesting projects that I've seen from him is The Vault of Mike Allred. This was a four issue miniseries that he self published under his imprint, AAA Pop Comics in 2006, yeah. which is about 20 years into his career. And I'm just going to start flipping because these things are kind of thick and we'll just kind of talk as we go along. But what they are is a chronological record of his comics career. So you see in the beginning some of the earliest stuff. This is a collage of paintings that he had. There are photos mixed in. And one of the great pieces is the red paragraphs. These are the captions that outline what we're looking at. And, uh, so it's direct commentary yes, from Mike from him. I love this thing. I wish every cartoonist that I that I love would do books like this. Because you get a real shot of his personality and kind of like what he was going through at these times, as well as seeing like a lot of work from a very talented guy that I don't know where else you would see this. This is yeah. stuff he's doing with his brother. Yeah. Um, and then he brings Laura on to color them later. So I don't know if I always agree with that. Sometimes I'd like to see the just the original art version, but man, they looks awesome. And this is something that, you know, again, a very, very, very young Mike Allred doing that. Yeah, never heard again, of it. Again, very young, trying to get into Kamiko, which he eventually does. But you can see him doing like, oh yeah, you know, he talks about the influence of the Mr. X's, the Dark Knight Returns, and Matt Wagner's Mage and Grendel as a, as a shift. You know, he had been interested in filmmaking and... That carries on throughout here. Some of the stuff that he does and some of the comics of his that are sort of adapted or partially adapted. But once he gets into those mid-80 comics, he's back. And that's what we're going to trace, uh, basically, the history of this. And it's really cool because in addition to bits of his art and background material, it's also like clippings. Yeah. And um, an update on our Love and Rockets box set feature, you know, we just heard from Gary Groth. The last volume in that Love and Rockets box set features this kind of thing where he's they're collecting a lot of the press that came out around love and rockets i love that stuff you yeah. know reading contemporary reviews and interviews i think is very valuable you know we look at this stuff 30 or 40 years later and sometimes meanings change it's nice to go back and see that original and that's what you get here Shelley Bond, then uh, Shelley Roberg working at Kamiko, uh, one of his first interactions with an editor that he would work with a lot, my first editor in this business. Also, you see him cross paths with a lot of contemporaries like Dave Stewart at a show. We're going to see a, uh, a Jeff Darrow signing is featured in here. So it's really a scrapbook of Mike Allred's... Dave Stevens. Oh, yeah. What did... Dave Stewart. Yeah, Dave Stevens. Sorry, my fault. Um but it's really a scrapbook of Mike Allred's comics history as a fan, as a creator, as a as a you know with his peers. It's amazing. In 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 some some ways, it it, it bums me out that we're cartoonists in the, the you know the new millennium and stuff because there's such a little press, like in terms of print on your shit. It's websites and stuff. It's way it feels it's way more ephemeral because like the early reviews of your comics that were out there like you cannot find the uh, is optical sloth still right. a thing you <laughs> exactly. know what i'm saying like yes. that shit is lost that shit is lost to the wayback machine like the wayback machine can't even hit that so uh, on one hand like looking at this stuff i'm like man the ego of the like hold on to that and but then i'm like nah man you know the very few print things that i got in like a playboy or like a new york times book review i have those so so you know it was just a different time yeah totally and and it's a wide array of things that he has. You know, like this is a Bernie Moreau collaboration. So you'll get like collaborations with other cartoonists that are in here. 
even like um, solicitations, uh, the ads and stuff. Yeah, it, it's just a, I don't know. It's a, it's an amazing piece, and we look at like artist editions and talk about, oh, this would be a cool feature to include, or you know, book collections. I feel like this would be amazing in the back of trade paperbacks and stuff, like, a, like you, tracing the rise of this stuff. Yeah, it's a heck of a zine. Yes, you know? yeah, and, it's exactly what it is. And it's interesting. Like, like, yeah, I would love to have these, but I could. I was picking up Atomics as they came out and things. These are like seven buck books. Yeah. Like, I'm sure I put those down. It was like, you know what? Like, seven dollars for this. Like, even now, like that's a lot. But he was publishing this stuff himself. It wasn't Mike Richardson's loot that uh, was being invested in this. So I've never really seen these. I can't imagine there are too many of them out there. Right. Not that easy to find. Uh, shout out to Jason Hamlin, Dealer of the Stars, is, is pretty much how I ended up with this set. Um, I think I got one issue and was into it, but then it's kind of hard to find. Note from Alan Moore. This is like his blurb for the back oh, of, uh, of, of Madman. Like, wouldn't you keep that if you had if you had access to a note from Alan Moore about, Dude, <laughs> about Red Room? I'll make you sick, man. <laughs> I, I, got, I got Dave Sim. Like, you know, like Dave Sim, like, writes your thing. Yep. Uh, from the day prize, like what he says about you. I don't have that anymore. Oh, no. Harvey Pekar correspondence, like uh, letters from Drew Friedman. Like, I, I don't have a lot. That's a shame, Ed. Yeah. You have so much of that good, like, childhood art. I have none of that, but I have most of, of this other stuff. Although I lost, I have a Library of Congress letter that I can't find at the moment. So, yeah, I, I wish I would hang on to this stuff better. And already even says in here that he throws a lot out. A Mark Schultz inking piece. So you get, like, little bits of craft mixed in, too. That's the other nice part with the running commentary is it's almost like a director's commentary. Yeah. You know, it covers all this different stuff. Uh, one of some other artists mentioned about using a brush and which brush to use, you know? And so, like, then you get to see what that looks like uh, as he comments his, on finding his, the right brush. His shit changed. When, yes. when he really discovered that brush, and then and then his style became that thick, bold outline with the thinner inner. And that that was that's the style, you know? Like, that's the linchpin style. And then his style morphed around this period, too, because, like, when you look at the covers, the way this shit is colored a little weird, uh, that was, like, when that Jay Bone dude started coming involved. Uh, and something he, like his inking to change. It's no no better or worse anything. It's just he had a stylish shift for sure. You know, talking about this as like a, a zine and something other cartoonists could do. If you did this as like a zine, this could be high enough resolution to read it all. Yeah. You know, like it wouldn't you wouldn't be crushed for space or anything like that. Yeah, it's it it really makes me think like this is such a little explored area. You know, yeah. archiving your stuff. You know, letters that you got Ed that you don't have anymore. If you had scanned those and thrown those on your Patreon or somewhere, like just having that record somewhere that, you know, future, you'd have access to them. Yeah. Because it is like, where do you save this stuff? We've talked about manga artists that end up buying a different house just to hold their original art. How about Words and Pictures Museum in Northampton? And uh, this is in here because Madman's one of the silhouettes in the windows. But this was Eastman's museum. And you can see like the upper stores or, the, you know, the upper stories would have a graphic in the window so they were backlit so it would be like the comic book characters almost like in panels so cool so i'll just kind of flip through these quickly um but i do think it's it's pretty interesting because again it covers 20 years so the styles that you talk about they're on display like you'll see those styles shift and he talks about some of those shifts and but the opportunities, you know, like there's stuff, there was a Sandman drawing early on, so you get a lot of those archive pieces, and that was Karen Berger telling him, you're not ready yet, kid. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to see, did a ton of work eventually, and, and talks about the benefit of doing that kind of Sandman work. Alex Ross had a, has a long relationship with Alex Ross, talks about how that friendship came together, and you know, art that they traded back and forth and did with each other. I remember for Vertigo, he did that Alex brother... Alex Toth praises Madman. He did that Brother Power the Geek yep. one-shot. Yeah, I think Toth did one of the cards, one yeah. of the uh, Madman cards. Yeah, he talks about those cards, and I think Allred just does a lot of stuff that I, I agree with. You know, like, there's pictures inside his house, like, in his studio, and you'll see original art. Like, he has a complete Kurtzman story that goes up the stairs. And he's like, you can go up to the studio and read this complete Kurtzman story as you go. I think he always really valued that, um, you know, like getting uh, your contemporaries to do artwork of his characters. There's that Klaus uh, Madman pinup and, uh, you know, one of the cards. And then like one of these magazines excerpts is him and Klaus are in this magazine. And it's like, oh, yeah, those guys probably crossed paths in like 88, you know, when they're both new. And 
struck up something at least. It's you interesting know, like because a, a brief relationship because they do pull from the same stuff. Uh, like certainly at, at the early Klaus level, that kind of kitschy Russ Meyer. 1950s kind of thing, but they've t- taken it in different directions. Right, like Klaus is like sneering at it, and and Allred like is like all in, like this is the shit unapologetic. Right, you know, like we dragged some stuff out of Dan Klaus. That, like <laughs> I've never heard him say in any interview. Go check out that shoot interview because he's there, he's there, but he's like self hating about his nerdiness. Yeah, and I, I mean, you can see as you go through this. All the different artists and all the different characters that make appearances. I remember this one, man, and uh, that's a, a big fat kill. Yes, and this is like the first color version whenever it was part of this newspaper or part of this book reprint. Yeah, I'd never seen it in color. And I always thought it was cool because he uses that coquille board mm-hmm. and, and like a grease pencil for that gray, which I thought was real sharp. Perfect for a noir. And there's stuff that shows up like this Fighting American. It says Frank Miller asked him to do this for some Fighting American job that, that never ended up materializing. So that's the first printing of this. So you get those little pieces too, but it does feel like both a love letter to comics, but also a history of comics from this like 20 year period. Yeah. Because there's so much overlap. It's it's incredible. You know, Matt Wagner and Art Adams, like a lot of name dropping because you know how it is. You do these signings and sometimes you have a couple people at the store getting involved with the View Askew universe, (laughs) which probably put him on a lot of people's radar for the first time. Tim Drawn, dude, like on that one part when like the greatest like cartoonist fantasy part, man, where they're they're, like in, in, in... Two drawing tables butted up like this. Yes. Pencil or inker. And the inker's like commenting, Oh, that's a really good light pole you drew. And he's like, <laughs> Oh, yeah, that, you know, that's the one across the such and such, man. Like, like well, I saw that as a kid. It was like, Oh, I'm going to grow up and like have my inker on the other side of the table. And we're going to talk about <laughs> light poles. <laughs> yeah, fire hydrant drawing skills. This is a video that we looked at in the past. Untold Tales of Spider-Man 96 annual. You can go check that out in our archives. It's like his first Marvel work. First Marvel work. Yeah. And that was a big deal. Like on that comic shop news. Remember that like free thing that would be outside? That was like a big deal that, you know, the Madman guy who who really built this career on the indie level uh, is going to deign to do some mainstream comics. And then he did that. I have like two issues of that. This is another big one. Yeah, I have that. I think we looked at that briefly in like our mega crossover episode, um, but possibly something worthy of a little bit more. And he talks about like Mike Richardson brought him this idea and Batman was being crossed over all the time. Yeah. Which gives him, you know, like, let's do a Superman. And it was when Superman had the mullet. Yeah. And he talks about he wanted classic Superman and they were moving back towards classic Superman. So he got to use classic Superman the whole time. Yeah, fuck that mullet. But this is really early. You know, this is, is kind of before All Red becomes what All Red becomes in some ways. He's well on his way. Yeah. And he was always stylistic but looking back on it it's like that happened pretty early in his career that's before he's really doing a lot of mainstream work oh that it absolutely is and it was a big deal that he was doing that crossover but he was like already here here's here's who he was because i was collecting comics at that time red rocket 7 is a breakthrough comic it's the size of like an lp and shit which meant that comic shops never bought it yes so that that hurt him but the caricature not even caricatures but the way he could capture likenesses of everybody just fucking blew me away. This is this is seed material for Hip Hop Family Tree in, a, in an abstract kind of way. That he's able to do like fictionalized comics, like where like Red Rocket Seven is like Forrest Gump, to like he just happens to be there when Chuck Berry like figures out a riff and when Elvis does this or that. But um, I was collect I was into c- comics. I was at the comic store and stuff like it with, with uh, the Mad Men era, and this is Mike Allred at that time. It's that other dude that's in Legend, but he's never done anything that ain't Legend. Like, he was kind of like the other guy. Oh, yeah, and, and the VHS for this was being sold at uh, Phantom for a thousand years. Yeah. They still might have the VHS copy yeah, on the not, shelves there. Not real well regarded, the, uh, the quality of that, that movie. He, and he talks about that in here, too. Because it's barely a movie. Like, like he, he made it with the with like ten thousand dollars from the option money to the Madman movie. Yeah. Because that movie, you know, perpetually in development or at least uh, under option rights, and so wanted to see a movie. I thought this was really cool as a one pager, colored here for the first time. Do you see the color is a little w- wacky? It's like it's like blue line or something. Yeah, I think that was um they did a lot of coloring that was like cell animation yeah. style. Yeah, and this was the era for that. Yeah, always cool to me that uh, he worked so closely with Laura Allred, which would be almost like you're chasing Amy where, like, your collaborator's in the room with you. How about that for a really crazy comic piece? Yeah, it's almost like a Kramer Zergo uh, 
It is. It, it would have been huge. It was whenever um, Dark Horse was doing that stuff like Comic Shop News. You know, like a lot of publishers would have that where it's like, here's the fold-out tabloid of uh, whatever we're promoting. Very inventive with this kind of playful, I don't know, layouts, ads, concepts. I don't know if we passed it already, but he did a book at DC Vertigo called Vertical. And it was like, it was like um, half the width of a comic and then, and then you know, tall. And I don't know what happened to my copy of it. I never see that book ever. Yeah, I don't but it was know experimenting it. with format. Many have tried. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Such a cautionary tale whenever you pull that stuff out. You know what it is? Spirit, like you just adventures. you just have to you just have to have that sort of back end. But you gotta try it. You gotta do it to stretch them a little bit, man. Like that's the coolest part of the grand designs is getting Marvel to fucking print those big things and then they'll print Peach's thing big or Trad Moore's thing big just like that. It ain't treasury format. It's hip hop family tree format. Hold up a treasury edition to it. <laughs> Hold up hip hop family tree to it. This is his self publishing whenever he gets into the self publishing time period around two thousand with Triple A, which, you know, this is six years later, so pretty successful and that he, he he maintained it for a long time he did it was on the, the shelf atomics. though like like yeah. atomics atomics was doing its thing it had 15 issues and then he would just put like a random one or two things a year which makes sense man yeah he talks about that too because he gets busy like once uh once everybody comes calling he gets that marvel deal with x-force and uh things get get very busy very quickly um savage dragon crossover you know eric larson gets to uh use madman so of course then he puts madman into atomics Atomics was getting a, pu a big push on the fan press and stuff before before it came out. It was so rare that I would um, be privy to any kind of like preview stuff. I was just a guy like going to the shop, seeing what's new on Wednesday. Like I didn't know any news because like I quit with fucking with Wizard and like uh, TCJ was just obtuse and like literally boring. Uh, so I would just be I wasn't online, um, but. Atomics got enough of a push, probably was in comic shop news, mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm sure was, was on my radar. That was probably all I had at the time. Yeah, that's an interesting time period, that, that uh, late 90s, early 2000s, where it was just a little bit of coverage online, but it was pretty disorganized and mostly big two. And yeah, it's, I don't know about dark period, but kind of a weird time. Um, this was pretty fun, talking about hooking up with Darwin Cook and how that comes about. You know, they worked together on that Catwoman uh, relaunch. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. I'll read, I guess the uh, the Catwoman, Selena's Big Score graphic novel came out, and I think that's all Darwin Cook. But then Ed Brubaker comes on board as, like, scripter, Darwin Cook's penciling, and All Red's inking. Oh, and I Brubaker's see. the guy that sort of connected them, and then it becomes, like, the rest of Darwin Cook's life, I believe. They're pretty close friends. And there'll be stuff in here that's Darwin Cook pencils and all red inks and then all red pencils and Darwin Cook inks. It makes sense. You know, they got that, that thick brush, that real slick, solid brush. And he's doing Catwoman and now he's doing Spider-Man and Iron Man. Things start moving pretty quick. This is a Bendis written book too. So, you know, like he's getting, starting to get a lot of that mainstream press. And I was kind of out of the loop too, like you. I was long done with Wizard and everything. So whenever it's like, wait, he's doing X-Force, he's doing all these marvel projects it was it just felt like i hadn't really seen that kind of move you know that was a big profile book and it ran for a while he says the big thing that really sinks this is whenever they were doing princess diana storyline do you remember this no and they were like three issues in i mean that's princess diana is it somebody with a different name or she's raised from the dead or something like it i don't know i i, I haven't investigated it enough there's probably some information about it but like here's the solicitation She's back. Okay, we know Marvel retracted any mention of Princess Di or the royal family in this ecstatic story, replacing all the names with fabricated characters that only resemble the deceased princess. But, I mean, it was it was promoted as, you know, Princess Di. That's so And wild. then I guess they retracted and changed names, and then they just, like, I you think killed the story. That's that Bill Jemis shit, man, with, like, ass-fucking and, and lollipops and vaginas and stuff. Like, they were out of control, man. This is your... Uh, like G.I. Joe articulated size kind of yeah that's sick kind of model and it's it's neat because like you go through he also has these flip corners which I don't think it'll show up on here oh that's classic that's classic to all it, is, it is all red even going back to like Tundra days um Dave Stevens oh yeah again doing classic image amazing all those guys would show up too like there was not one dashed out piece whenever there was the uh 
um, Madman cards. Madman's a nice character to draw. The design's really good, so I think everybody kind of rose to the occasion. Here's that vertical story that I was mentioning. Looks like it even opens on the uh, on that skinny axis, so you have like two up, but only half the width of a comic, and a lot of uh, a lot of vertical <laughs> kind of what what can you make a tall panel of? So buildings and stuff, but. I do, you know, I, I bought that book, so I do remember that thing coming out. Um, Wizard covering, like, casting calls. Some of his pencils. I love seeing that. Always curious, like, how tight somebody pencils. Yeah. So it's nice to see those, because I don't see a ton of his pencil work. That part's pretty cool. But it really does trace this history of a guy going from indie comics trying to, you know, afford to pay his family to way more work than he can possibly handle. It made me want to, uh, I, I had notes as I was going through this and like, there's some solo issues we've got to cover. Yeah, for sure. As a result. And Craig Thompson shows up whenever they're like at some, I, I don't know if it's Angoulême or uh, Barcelona, Spain, they were at a show together. So, you know, you have these like unlikely traveling companions, right? You're, you're sharing meals together. You know how it is whenever you're at these international shows and you're a couple of Americans there, you end up kind of uh, lumped together. And again, Allred's a likable guy if you if you ever meet him. So I think friendships are struck up. His Book of Mormon adaptation, something that he talks about here for a couple of pages. I think I have one issue of that. But I always find that kind of stuff, like any kind of this religious uh, comics, that, interesting. Was that a AAA? I think it was. I feel like that's something you could get, like the Church of Latter-day Saints, to put cough up some loot. Yeah, because I think it's a pretty straight adaptation. I don't see the logo on there, but I, th I think that was self-published, I'm pretty sure. And he took his time with it. I think in here he wasn't done with it yet. And he's saying like maybe one book a year. Mm. Yeah, it's probably hard. Yeah, you want to be true to it. Um, and getting the period centric stuff, because it's like, you know, you, you could fall down a fucked up rabbit hole of like, all right, the pots and the spoons and the doors. Like, there's a lot you got to get right. And basically everybody just watches Cecil B. DeMille movies and does their best with that. Feral Dalrymple makes an appearance uh yeah and then james jean again not sure where they all cross paths but another james jean piece uh commissions are in here because he starts doing like storyboards for a madman movie which is kind of cool to see again you get to see his pencils and the guy's a really good drawer oh yeah Pretty Pretty prolific. Great, great figure artist just beautiful faces and stuff love all these effects but uh, while he's doing this then he's taking on commissions because he's not really drawing comics he's just doing hundreds of storyboards and uh, some of those those things kind of round this out. The Batman and the solo stuff. So you get to see like him doing his bat dance with different uh, different characters, Inventing, trying to figure out what cover to, to use like, for solo. When he did that Batman, that like, of course there was going to have to be a Batman sixty six. Yes, because like, that's awesome. When uh, we just we did a video, I did a video with. Um, did you know he did the cover for Super Folks? I did, and I have the exact one too. Yeah, the, the the famous Alan Moore cites this as being an influence on Watchmen. You see a forward by Grant Morrison, uh, kind of a cult superhero novel. Yeah, and whenever they reissued it, Allred gets the call for the cover of that. Yeah, what was I just talking about? Solo and the Batman sixty six. How that had to happen? Yeah. Um. Oh well, whatever. Yeah, the perfect guy for it too. For like oh no, no, no! The, a, a, vi a video from uh, like with Jeff Darrow and Brian Moss from our, talking about our travels in Japan, and 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 uh, Jeff Darrow do, drew this Spider Man that is so fucking dope, and you see all the fabric and stuff, and he and Jeff Darrow just said something like, you know, I want like a Adam West Batman with, with like the the cloth outfit, spandex, and it looks like it. And he's just fucking killing people. And I'm like, you know what? I want that too. I, I, do I, too. I haven't stopped thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Darrow, boot like Spider Man comic. Bring it on. Yeah, that Spider Man comic. I mean, that or, or like I, I told him on the vid, I'm like, dude, like my big regret, because he was just like so nice, you know? And, and he's just like, oh, take something. And it's like, I'm not taking it. Sell your art, man. But like, I could have. And I, I like that Spider Man, like the fact that I let that Spider Man piece go, it's going to haunt me the rest of my life, man. Yeah, that's a bummer. We need to really uh, lean on Mr. Darrow to uh, do some more Spider-Man art because that sounds incredible. <laughs> it's a great drawing, man. It's super cool to look at. I, I, I wish that there was more of this kind of stuff. It's almost like an oral history of comics for the 20 years this covers from Allred's point of view. And because he's so personable, man, a lot of people make appearances. He's all over the world traveling and doing this. 
not every cartoonist would be capable of putting something like this together, but I'd still love to see everybody's kind of overview, you know, reflect on the on their 20, 30 years in the business and what, what stands out, what they kept, who they bumped into. It's just a cool piece of comics history to me. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, cool little artifact, man. Uh, I'm good if you are. Yep. All right, kayfabers, we have a Patreon going on right now. That's going to help you mitigate the kayfabe effect because we're delivering uh, various number of videos depending, depending on your level of support to the channel. Uh, but if you don't uh, give to the Patreon, it doesn't affect you in any way. You're still getting a video every single day. Hit up the link in the description below this video. Like, follow, subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so we can notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, tell the people what's out there. Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Live is back in print, so available wherever you buy books. If it's not on your shelf, put it there. Plain Jane's also in print. Hulk Grand Design. Comic books are available now. The Oversized Treasury Edition, the hip-hop size edition, okay. will be out at the uh, coming soon, early 2023. So pre-order that if you haven't already. And uh, join me on my Patreon at patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can see a lot more of my art and process, and you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics. Red Room is the focus uh, for myself right at this moment. I have two trade paperbacks of it out there uh, in the wild right now, the Antisocial Network and Red Room Trigger Warnings. Working on the third right now. Uh, it's in progress, and I'm serializing those pages on my Patreon uh, today. We have links in our link tree in the description below for our uh our personal stuff as well as the, the kayfabe patreon jimmy tell the people what else we have out there man subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video you can also find cartoonist kayfabe t-shirts merchandise mugs stickers all kinds of great stuff at our spread shop that link is also below this video another great way to support the cartoonist kayfabe channel jimmy giving us more two quarters we'll be on our way make more comics <laughs>